Uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? My name is Gordon Hull. I'm the director of the Ethics Center here at UNC Charlotte. And I'd like to welcome everybody to today's talk by Alex Hanna, about whom more in just a minute. Uh, Alex, the, Alex is presenting as part of a series we're doing this year on bias in AI. Uh, we had Ben Green talk earlier and Serena Wang. Both of those talks are currently up on the center's YouTube channel. You can get there by going to the website, which is ethics.uncc.edu. And then there's a little, you know, the YouTube logo up there. Uh, so I'd invite anyone who missed those talks and wants a chance to see them to do so. We also have uh, a series running on the way African researchers intersect with global funding networks. We had a talk, uh, Rafila Masekala, also up on the channel for that. This will be the last talk we have this semester, but there will be some next semester. And because, and so I wanted to do a little bit of preemptive advertising for those. Well, I'm gonna be one of those people that can't get it. There we go. Um, so in the Bias AI series, uh, Ngozi Okedegepe, who is a law professor at Yeshiva University in New York, we're going to be talking about policing. Uh, we haven't worked out the details of the date or time yet, but you should look forward to that. Also, Karen Levy, who does sociology at Cornell, will present her work on the automation and AI management of the trucking industry. And if you haven't heard Karen talk about this stuff, it is super, super interesting, and it's a real treat. And she has a book coming out on it. I think sometime around now. Uh, that talk is currently scheduled for April 6th. Also then on the African Research Series, uh, Nikki Mulder, who's a computational biologist at the University of Cape Town, uh, was at work on the status of the various omics research, research in Africa, the access to databases and that sort of thing. Uh, that's on February 15th. And finally, Ife Aniebo, at Harvard, although she's been at various other places, including Oxford and the Wellcome Trust, uh, and is currently doing work on surveillance of malaria in Nigeria. Uh, the date hasn't been set for that yet, but we'll be welcoming her as well. And then hopefully we're trying to put together at least one, one or two more speakers in the African Research Series. So this means you'll want to know all about our programming in the spring and to find out about that, you can either go to the center's website, again, it's ethics.uncc.edu, or if you're more contemporary, you could do our follow our Instagram page or our Facebook. Both of those are logos up near the YouTube logo on the screen. Uh, so today's speaker, Alex Hanna, is someone whose work I've actually found really useful in the last few weeks. I've been trying to do my own stuff on accountability in AI ethics. Alex is the senior researcher in AI ethics at Google. And the papers I've been reading have been really doing a deep dive into what it would mean, not just to say that data sets are biased, but the very weird and unpredictable and strange ways that they become distorted, unrepresentative, and potentially very harmful to uh, citizens that are trained on them. So without saying anything else about Alex's work, I will just turn the table over to her. Alex. Thank you so much, Gordon. And thank you so much for having me here today. As Professor Hall mentioned, my name is Alex Hanna. I am a sociologist and senior research scientist uh, at Google on the ethical AI team. The name of my talk today is um, called Beyond Bias, Algorithmic Unfairness Infrastructure and Genealogies of Data. Um, and what I kind of the rough agenda today is to outline um, algorithmic unfairness as a field, uh, talking about different interventions that have been made there on the levels of data. Moving on, then talking about the kind of view of data as infrastructure. And then lastly, concluding with the research program my colleagues and I have been pursuing at Google Research uh, and, and with our collaborators on this research agenda. Okay, so let's go into it. Be this that y'all are, um, this is a series on algorithmic bias. You probably heard this story before, but let me tell it once again as a foreground. Um, when um, Joy Bolomini started 
uh, her research at MIT as a master's student. Um, she wanted to get involved with facial analysis research, um, a work that looked at how different tools could be used for facial analysis. Um, but when she turned one of these facial analysis tools towards herself, um, it, it, it didn't recognize her. Uh, you can see Joy Bolomini. Uh, now, Dr. Bolomini uh, is a dark skinned Black woman, and it couldn't recognize her dark face and dark skin. And when she, but then when she put on this white mask, uh, actually recognized the mask. Um, and so she stated in, in a very Fanonian fashion in my case, a white mask is a closer fit to what the system has learned was a face than my actual human face. And this has been well documented uh, online uh, in, 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 in the movie Coded Bias. So um, Dr. Bolomini, as well as Dr. Tanit Tabru, one of the co-leads or co-founders of the Ethical AI team at Google, who was recently unjustly fired uh, or, or was unjustly fired a year ago, um, developed an audit of this uh, of various commercial AI systems and how well they did gender classification as a task. Now we can call, talk about the validity of gender classification as it is uh, in the Q&A or later, um, but um, what they showed is that they had gathered this new benchmark data set, well, what they call the Pilot Parliament's benchmark data set, and that's just how well these algorithms did on these data sets on, on, on various different faces. In a project that they called Gender Shades, uh, which is also published as a paper at uh, the Fact Now Fact Conference in 2018. Um, probably not a surprise, it's a well trodden narrative now that um, these systems did much more poorly on gender skinned women compared to lighter skinned men, with a gap up to 34% in the worst of models. In a similar example, um, there have been analyses of different object recognition AI systems, either commercial AI systems or, or systems trained on popular data sets. And a study that Facebook AI researchers, uh, DeVries and others have shown is that these object recognition systems also do fairly poorly on objects which are not in the West um, and not in higher income uh, locales. And so in their paper, what they did is that they took this data set called a Dollar Street data set, and they obtained um, the incomes of particular households um, around the world, and they took pictures of uh, common household items. What they ended up doing is training uh, object recognition classifiers on a set of popular benchmark or training data sets. And when they turned this against um, certain kinds of household items in lower income households in the quote unquote global south, uh, they found that these, there were kind of mass um, uh, errors in classification. So on the left, this, this ground truth is soap in Nepal, uh, but it was classified as food, cheese, dish, wood cooking. Whereas on the right, this, uh, this, this image of soap taken in a higher income UK household was, was, was classified correctly. This is not quite surprising because the training data and benchmark data, um, and, and I'll talk about what those things are a bit more in a moment, are drawn mostly from uh, the, the global North or uh, North America and Western Europe. And so ImageNet, MS Coco open images mostly drawn from uh, um, the US uh, and Western Europe, whereas the world population is distributed much, much more differently from that. Um, and so there have been some interventions in the corporate and academic sphere to mediate and remedy these. Um, so one of the interventions that has been uh, gotten a lot of press in the past few years has been IBM researches a release of the diversity in faces data set, which is purported to advance the study of fairness in facial recognition systems. You've also seen other kinds of elements of this, such as Google, uh, Google's Pixel 6, um, uh, being able to recognize darker skin faces. Wow. Um, so these interventions can play a role in mitigating certain algorithmic harms, um, but it's actually not only 
at the level of who is represented in the data set. As a particularly glaring example, the facial recognition um, uh, data set that was released by IBM was drawn from a Flickr, uh, well, Flickr um, and uh, even though that these um, images were uh, licensed in such a way that anyone could use them uh, using a Creative Commons license, these were drawn without individual consent. You can think about the same way in the Google Pixel uh, debacle in which uh, an individual, uh, it was reported that the, the contractors who had uh, were collecting pixel data were, were offering them to uh, uh, unhoused uh, black people in Atlanta and going to uh, and, and targeting um, um, particular people um, in, in particularly extractive types of relationships. This is akin to what terms of inclusion or modes of inclusion that are unethical and extractive, what Louise Seamstra has called predatory inclusion in, in student loan debt, as well as Kiana Yama Taylor as student predatory inclusion in housing. So one of the things I want to hammer home in this talk is this point that has been made in, in, by historian of science Aaron Plas, who has said to, under, to begin to understand how biases are propagated and reinforced in machine learning system training data, we need histories of the data sets themselves. And to unpack that statement a little further, if we want to actually understand and intervene in harms of ML systems, we really need to interrogate the histories of those data sets their data practices, and then values, the values and assumptions embedded in the data sets themselves. That gives motivation to the second part of this agenda in this talk, which is understanding data sets as a type of infrastructure. And to talk about this, I'm going to draw a lot on this particular data set named ImageNet. Now, ImageNet um, is a one of the most well-known and canonical and influ influential computer vision data sets. Um, it was dreamed up by a team of researchers from Princeton and Stanford, and they wanted to use this data to develop visual object recognition, as in the systems that can uh, systems that can recognize particular objects in the images, as drawn as, as shown a little earlier. ImageNet consists of fourteen million images organized into about twenty thousand categories. And at the time of its creation, it was one of the largest data sets ever created for visual object recognition, probably for any kind of purpose, to be honest. Its immediate predecessor, Pascal VOC, had only 20,000 images in 20 categories, 20 categories, so something of the order of, of, of a sort of a, a 100 fold um, increase. The words that are, that are in the labels on images in ImageNet are drawn from a much older uh, data set called WordNet, which is a large database of English words organized into a hierarchical based um, relationship. It was developed in the 80s by cognitive psychologist George A. Miller. And what they ended up doing is that they took words from WordNet and they entered them into various search terms and scraped the images um, from web search um, based on this. And so this is sort of the late 2000s. So it's not only Google image search, but also AltaVista, uh, uh, Yahoo, Bing, image search, et cetera. After those are scraped from the web, they then reviewed each of these images um, with a, a set of human annotators to confirm the presence or absence of the image. And then they associated that, that in, in, in the data set. I'll talk about a lot of this a little later uh, uh, in, in a particular case study that we focus on on ImageNet. So ImageNet's regarded as a key benchmark in the development of AI technology. Um, and, and, and I want to show particularly why. Um, it's, it's credited with um, leading to the modern era of deep learning. And to for this to happen, this happened due to a few things. One of these things is that the ImageNet creators developed a challenge or a competition in which individuals or teams uh, were to develop their own algorithms to correctly classify objects and images. And this competition ran from 2010 to 2017. Um, they did this to facilitate wider adoption of ImageNet. 
Um, and it was a it was built from a subset, and it, it didn't expect people to classify all 14, 14 million images, but a subset of 1.5 million images organized into 1,000 categories. Um, and so you see this inflection point. This graph and this in, on this slide shows the uh, across time uh, uh, on, on the x-axis, and then the amount of compute needed to actually um, train particular machine learning models. And we actually see this inflection point happen at this particular point in 2012. Um, mostly this, this owes to a particular algorithm called AlexNet, no relation, named after the lead author, Alex Kravinsky at the University of Toronto, leading a team uh, of, uh, of Kravinsky, Sutzkever, and, and Jeff Hinton, all at the University of Toronto at the time. Um, the new thing about AlexNet is it resuscitated a older line of thinking within machine learning research called deep neural networks um, or deep learning. Um, nearly all computer vision tasks or natural language processing tasks these days rely on some kind of flavor of deep learning. If you've heard of something like, if you've heard of text analysis like BERT or um, a GPT-3 developed by OpenAI, these all rely on neural network architectures. Um, so with that, the amount of compute, the size of data sets, and the specialization of hardware infrastructure have all increased exponentially. And really the influence of ImageNet and, uh, excuse me, the influence of AlexNet and by extension ImageNet really can't be overstated. Um, this paper published in 2012, the last time I updated this chart, had about 80,000 citations. I'm sure if you checked it more recently, it had closer to 90,000 or 100,000. The individuals involved have gone on to um, work at some of the most influential uh, 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 machine learning startups or existing labs. So Sutzkever has gone on to co-found and become the chief scientist at OpenAI the developer of, uh, uh, of GBT2 and 3 and uh, technologies like Wally -E, uh, and Dolly, et cetera. Excuse me, Dolly, Wally -E was a movie. Um, Jeff Hinton, who is now emeritus professor at Toronto, is, engineering, is an engineering fellow at Google. In 2018, along with Yoshio Bengio and Jan Lacoon, he won computer science's highest honor, the Turing Award. Um, so it really can't be overstated how important ImageNet has become and the canonical story of deep learning's evolution and development. Uh, but when we dig into ImageNet a bit more, you actually see a lot of weird things come about. Um, in a particular archaeology of ImageNet, researcher Kate Crawford and artist Trevor Paglin wanted to see what categories were actually in the data set. Uh, so they delved into the person subclass. As I mentioned, uh, ImageNet is organized according to the WordNet hierarchy, uh, as in some things inherit from other things. You can think about this like a dictionary, but it's organized in a tree structure rather than kind of a, 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 a list or array of terms. They find categories such as ball buster, which features images of women with no unifying theme. Bonds one or bonds clean, closet clean, drug addict or junkie, failure, loser, uh, non starter, Jezebel, mistress or kept woman, second rater, and wimp, chicken or crybaby. Uh, thanks for linking to the project, Gordon, excavating.ai. So there's a bizarre relationship from nouns to images within WordNet, namely the assumption that nearly all words have some kind of physical or imageable relationship to images which exist in the world. There is, of course, no reason to believe that the relationship between images and their meanings is complex, mediated, and complicated. As Crawford and Paglin state in the weird metaphysics of the image set, there are separate image categories for assistant professor and associate professor. As though if someone were to get a promotion, their, bio, their biometric signature would reflect the change in rank. As I mentioned earlier, WordNet's categorical roots um, or, or ontological roots can be traced back to WordNet and the way that WordNet organizes particular things into what are called sin sets. Um, and so this, this features into some of the reason the categories appear as they do. 
Moreover, Crawford and Paglin didn't stop with the archaeology of ImageNet. They also trained their own machine learning model using the deep learning framework CAFE on the ImageNet prison category. And they released a tool called ImageNet Roulette. Probably seen this because the tool spread quickly through Twitter and Facebook and being written about in the tech press and beyond. While many of the categories proved curious or humorous, many were naturally offensive, racist, and sexist. Julius, uh, uh, um, excuse me, tech journalist Julia Carey Wong wrote about how tech, uh, about him image that called her a racist slur, which I won't repeat aloud. While New York Times editor Jamal Jordan was consistently labeled as black black person. In other terms, regardless of any of the images that he uploaded. So what are the implications when the cutting edge methods of AI are trained, tested and validated on data sets such as these? It's not even a requirement that a vision model be trained on ImageNet to have deleterious downstream effects. As we saw in the example of outset methods which are based on these data sets have a rather uh, rhetorical and institutional way constructing more and more accepted black boxes in, in the Latorian sense upon which modern AI infrastructure is being progressively built. This is why Emily Denton, Razvan Avronesi, and the Smart and Hillary Nicole, Morgan Klaus Charman and I have termed this and have started thinking about data sets as a particular type of AI infrastructure. We draw this analogy from infrastructural studies, thinking, building on the works of um, Jeffrey Bacher, Susan Lee Starr, uh, and Sel Strauss and others. And we outline four ways in which data sets in machine learning can be thought of as a type of infrastructure. At the most obvious and localized level, training data sets determine what a resulting machine learning model learns, how problems are framed, and what solutions get prioritized. Statistical properties of a data set determine category boundaries and who or what is rendered legible by a downstream model. Furthermore, label data sets organized by a particular categorical schema frequently subsume modeling decisions regarding conceptualization, operationalization, and measurement of target variables for downstream classification systems. And those data sets themselves frequently embed metrics of success. So in the case of ImageNet, uh, there's this great blog post by Nicholas Melev that looks about how the specific practices of photography and of sharing images on the web, particularly in the late 2000s, gave rise to a particular view of the world which sees, for instance, hammerhead sharks as objects of scientific inquiry, trout as dead trophies, and lobsters primarily as food. Secondly, data sets play a significant role in benchmarking AI algorithms. Benchmark data sets are recognized as go-to standards for evaluation and comparison in particular machine learning communities. And they often take on an authoritative role um, such that improvements on performance, performance metrics signal uh, progress in the field. So data sets that achieve such authoritative status also play a unique and powerful role in structuring research agendas and values within machine learning subfields. That's, that's been uh, discussed by um, Doton and Millie, for instance, in their 2020 fact paper. In the case of ImageNet and in particular AlexNet, um, after the AlexNet victory in 2012, all data set, all um, methods in the ImageNet classification that won the competition uh, used some version of deep convolutional neural networks, which be, made it a particular sort of agenda setting um, in research program orienting uh, a mode of doing research within uh, object recognition. And, and as I mentioned earlier, within computer vision, in, in, in natural language processing writ large. Third, because data sets and their associated benchmarks take on this authoritative nature, they take the status of the model organism uh, or model organism within laboratory studies. So building on other work on, in laboratory studies, uh, such as this uh, a, a, um, excellence edited volume by uh, edited by Angela Krieger, as well as the uh, work on fruit flies by Robert Kohler, um, we, these, these, um, these types of 
uh, infra infrastructures, data set infrastructures, um, become these types of model organisms. The characteristics of model organisms are pragmatic. They are readily available. They're easy to manipulate and somewhat uncomplicated in form. However, the cheapness and availability of the model organism can also open itself to a set of conceptual and empirical gaps. Um, so you can see in the image example, it's really easy to import these data sets. It takes two lines to do this in TensorFlow, which is one of the most popular uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning frameworks, as well as to load the um, parameter weights in the um, in the in 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 um, in uh, TensorFlow as well. These become stand-ins um, for kind of larger processes um, and don't really have uh, pro um, kind of uh, ecological validity beyond uh, looking at the data set themselves. Um, and then lastly, these, these data sets operate as infrastructure because publicly available research data sets provide the methodological backbone of how AI tools are deployed in industry contexts. The boundary between research and practice is thin and pliable as AI researchers flip between academia and industry. Excuse me. Accordingly, that research that flows, flows between them and enters into commercial products. So most technology companies derive their value from the amount and kind of data they collect. And those data are much larger than those that are publicly available in research data sets. So it's not the case that ImageNet, for instance, is being deployed in industry contexts, let's say by um, Google or Facebook. But those shifts are conceptualized by researchers as merely changes in scale and rarely in kind. So the kind of infrastructural function undergird the material research needs upon which commercial AI research is also built and deployed. So you can see um, on, the, on the right, um, there's, there's been this huge increase in the amount of data that's available. Google has an internal data set called JFT300, the kind of the, the descriptions of which are pretty thin, but described in a, in a paper published in 2017 by um, Sun et al. And what I want to show here is not that it's, it's sort of bad that these uh, companies are gathering more data to do this, but that kind of you can imagine same, the same kind of work practices that are used to develop these data exist in both contexts. Uh, and, and don't really uh, change um, as they go and are commercialized and, 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 and monetized. In uh, the third part of my talk, in the last part of the talk, I want to go through the research program that my colleagues and I have outlined for thinking through a genealogy of data. And for this, we ask four questions. Um, first, we ask, how do data set developers describe and motivate the decisions that go into the creation of these data sets? Um, and for that, we can think about this as taking a wide view of different data sets um, that are used in AI practice. And so in a paper that my uh, former intern, Martin Klaus Sharman, Emily Denton, my colleague at Google Research and I wrote and published at CSCW, um, we, wanted to look at understanding um, the kind of a broad view of computer vision research. Um, and so what we did in this CSCW paper is that we collected all the documentation we could find on 113 computer vision data sets. And we looked at websites, papers, and technical reports included in them. Um, we did this by sampling from a uh, kind of a near population list of, of data sets that drew mostly on um, uh, 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 image data sets that had to do with people, uh, objects, animals, um, and whatnot. And we coded them for 104 different uh, qual quantitative variables, such as is the main contribution to the database? Does the data set contain images of real humans? Do the authors explain explicit ethical considerations of either the collection or use of the database? And we also coded these thematically for variables such as the motivation for their creation, 
ethical considerations and other values in value-related terms. So as an example of a quantitative variable that we examined, we wanted to look at how much of these papers and documentations actually um, were dedicated to describing the data set. And we counted paragraphs in here. So while about 20% of the data set documentation papers fully dedicated text describing the data sets, the majority of documentation dedicates 50% or less of the text to describing them. And as I'm gonna note later uh, in describing this, this indicates that there's much more of a bias towards model work rather than data work in the work of AI. Um, and this is uh, uh, kind of echoes work that's been done qualitatively, interview work by my colleague, Nithya Sambhavasian and others, uh, such as my colleague, Ben Hutchinson on the FMLAI AI team. Uh, moreover, data sets are not built for longevity or reproducibility. Following the work of computer scientists and library scientists, Victoria Stodden, Christine Borgman, um, uh, uh, Irene Pascato, and others, we find that the data sets are difficult, difficult to find, to download, and are rarely hosted on the website of an institutional repository. So for instance, of the 114 papers we look at, only 69 represent a URL, have a URL in the paper, um, if they had any website at all. Uh, when we searched, uh, searched for this, we had 97 of them. Of the 69 websites reported in the papers, 46 are, only, are still available. Of the 80 papers which didn't rec that didn't require uh, registration to download, only 59 were still downloadable. Notably, um, only three papers had a stable DOI number and only one was hosted on an institutional repository. Um, moreover, considering ethical considerations, these were nearly absent in the computer vision data set. Um, only five of the 100 data sets containing human subjects mentioned having an IRB or international equivalent review. Only five mentioned privacy considerations in any capacity and none of them contain an ethical consideration section, which has become um, a normalized practice within NeurIPS, which is the largest uh, uh, neural network conference or machine learning conference starting from, and they started this practice last year. Um, and, and I believe ACL is, uh, which is the largest conference for computing linguistics is having this um, um, become a regular practice as well. We know that even data sets with especially sensitive human data, such as the new detection, detec uh, detection data set by um, uh, one author, Lopez, and others, where nude collections were collected from the web, they had no collection mention of ethics, privacy, or even an ethics review process. So we find four main trade offs in the analysis of these data sets. First, data set authors valued efficiency, both in terms of time spent and associated costs, monetarily and computationally, of gathering and annotated data. Authors sought desirable properties in terms of objective, unbiased, neutral, and comprehensive data that are easily available quickly and cheaply classifiable and able to be accurately annotated. The value of efficiency was clear, but contrast that to the principles of care which data sets could be attentive to. Valuing efficiency was at the, the cost of care, valuing slow and thoughtful decision-making and data processes, considering more ethical ways to collect data and treat annotators and seeking fair compensation or even reporting compensation at all for data labor. Secondly, data sets value universality in lieu of contextuality. Um, they value large-scale diverse realistic data that lent a belief that there was some kind of complete categorical classification of real-world phenomena. But this was at the expense of contextuality, such as how circumstances such as time, location, or use shape the world and thus the data in the data set. So for instance, language used to classify objects or people in data sets were not attempted to, you know, why you use particular types of language. Um, specific identity markers, in addition, were chosen that were chosen for representing diversity were absent. So this is a there's a great work by uh, Morgan Klaus Charman, one of the co-authors on this paper, and 
uh, and a few other of, of his co-authors showing that uh, racial categories are sort of picked with no rationale, rationale at all. Um, third, we found that the universe of data was awfully really highly constrained to a specific um, quote unquote impartial worldview. Um, they, they aim to say that these were impartial, um, that data was unbiased, but um, you know, there's no unbiased view, it just becomes unaccounted for. And we'll talk about that a little more in the next paper that I want to discuss. And lastly, the fact that many authors posited data as crucial, many of the pieces of the data collection curation processes were missing from documentation, including often the data itself. Reporting and evaluation of the model work is what was typically incentivized rather than the careful, slow data work. And so this echoes uh, what I was talking about earlier with the, the finding validated by uh, Samavasian and others. So that was our first question, taking this broad view of looking at the kind of motivations uh, and descriptions of decisions that go to the creation of data sets. Secondly, we asked, what are the histories and contingent conditions of the creation of particular benchmark data sets? And for this, we returned to ImageNet. In a recent paper that uh, my colleagues and I published at Big Data and Society, we wanted to interrogate and take a critical history of ImageNet counter to some of the, the um, discourses that, that, has, that have been reported in the press around ImageNet. So what we ended up doing is doing a discourse analysis of several different texts um, that are associated with ImageNet, including but not limited to uh, slideshows, talks, um, tech press, as well as other types of um, documentation, and papers that are uh, talking about different types of image data sets used in computer vision research. We found primarily three things in looking at those documentations and those, um, those texts. First, one thing was the sea change of how particular types of data full uh, or, or data-driven AI are being developed and how that's represented as sea change and how AI research is done, which echoes the work of Don't and a million others that have focused on the changing nature of AI research. ImageNet was developed to be a training resource and benchmarking tool for computer vision practitioners. But the image, the impacts of the data sets creation extend far beyond the materiality of the data set and the subfield of computer vision. Uh, the implications of the ImageNet mode of research have been felt all over AI research and the creation of parallel image nets of X have become the de facto standard of doing research in image net and beyond and vision research and beyond. So in, in a screenshot from a talk given by image net progenitor Fei Fei Li, she talks about how there's these copycats of the image net of X, space net, music net, medical image net, shape net, event net, activity net, and others. Sebastian Ruder, um, who is currently I think, a Google research uh, or DeepMind, I forget which, uh, has asked in a blog post on the gradient whether uh, natural language processing is having an image net moment. And this is seen as a virtue rather than uh, kind of a cost of doing research. Secondly, central to image sets epistemology is the assumed existence of an underlying or universal organization of visual, visual world into clearly demarcated concepts. And we can kind of trace this idea back to WordNet. Fei-Fei Li's understanding of the underlying aims of WordNet was to organize thousands, hundreds of thousands of English words into a massive ontology, which inspired directly the creation of the internet. And in an anecdote, um, Li likes to talk about how she talked about the uh, talk to uh, one of the stewards of the WordNet project and how it directly inspired the creation of ImageNet. But there's no reason to believe that there's this kind of direct relationship of images to objects. As I mentioned earlier, the relationship between images and their meanings is complicated, mediated, and contextual, with entire fields such as art history, media studies, structural sem semiotics, and symbolic hermeneutics dedicated to the study of the relationship between the objects and their representation and images. 
But the documentation and publications accompanying ImageJet do very little work to motivate, justify, or analyze the relationship between WordNet categories and their accompanying images. Through the submission, the ImageJet creators signal a presumable self-evident relationship between WordNet nouns in the visual world. The act of recognition within this epistemology, whether by human or machine, is one of identification or verification of an underlying truth of what an image depicts. Broader discourses surrounding ImageNet further suggests a problematization, problem, problematization, excuse me, problematization, I'm not gonna say that word correctly, so I'm going to go on, of object recognition rooted in the decontextualized and non-situated physicalist account of human vision. What do I mean by this? Well, for instance, when we look at the work from, let's say, the, the creators of another vision data set, MS Coco, they talk about um, how they basically uh, showed images to kids. In this case, it was the, the children of some of the creators and were like, what's in these images? And they literally used the vision of children to take a sort of a universal. Um, and that was their, was their criteria of including objects or categories in the data set. Uh, in a similar way, Fei-Fei Li has talked about the Cambrian explosion, a theory within evolution of evolutionary biology, which talks about the development, uh, the evolutionary development of sight and how the direct, um, the direct uh, development of this huge uh, part of the uh, brain in various animals uh, as of the, of the visual, um, I'm not gonna say this, but the frontal cortex, of the brain was used for image processing. But because they adopt this physicalist account of human vision, um, they fail to account for the particularities of this view. Uh, the particular particularities that largely reflect a white Western and male gaze and wield a naturalistic rhetoric in, from popular scientific discourse um, to actually justify how there's some kind of a uh, kind of a one version of actually seeing the world. And so we can understand ImageNet and the myriad of image data sets that have followed it instead as a technical instantiation of what Donna Haraway has called the God trick, uh, the view that sees everything from nowhere. This parallel is exemplified well by the logo of, from Fei-Fei Li's Vision Lab, which has this unsettling singular machine eye with a sclera made of sky and an iris made of a computer lens, uh, a camera lens with the motto under it to build computers that see. This is taken from another slide um, uh, from a presentation that we was given. And lastly, one of the major challenges of constructing ImageNet according to Lee's account was the verification of these vast amounts of image data gathered from internet search engines. Under, university undergrads were initially utilized for this task, but were quickly abandoned um, because uh, uh, collaborator Jia Deng calculated that it would take 19 years to label the entire data set using university undergrads. Notably, undergrad work is subjected to interruptions. Uh, it's contingent on external factors, such as funding, the timing of the school year, and you have to train uh, uh, people constantly. The ImageJet creators sought a techno-social configuration which would place humans in the position to speedily perform basic tasks of image recognition without interruption and at low cost. Enter Amazon Mechanical Turk, which was developed in the late 2010s, uh, excuse me, late 2000s. Um, and it was, quote, according to Lee, a tool that could scale that we couldn't possibly dream of by hiring Princeton undergraduates. Lee describes the new affordances offered by M. Turkers as a godsend, but despite being framed as a divine solution to a technical problem, they are not acknowledged named individually as active contributors or positioned as active stakeholders in the construction and design of ImageNet. Um, the ImageNet creators do not disclose how much the annotators would pay. They don't dis disclose uh, which countries have the large numbers of annotators, nor did they discuss or whether or I don't think they collected any demographic characteristics of their annotators. 
The silence is structural. MTurkers are not in the economy of the data set actual individual contributors. They are utilized as a generic human intelligence resource capable of executing the requested task of labeling images on the Mechanical Turk platform. This is premised on the idea that all humans have the innate capacity to recognize images in the same way and approach the vision that erases um, kind of the, the complicated contextualized meanings and formation, what I discussed in the, in the prior slide. Uh, the functional roteness, infrastructural devaluation, and abstractness of the annotation task is not lost to ImageNet's creators. In a slide deck from 2010, they asked themselves if they're exploiting chain prisoners with this work. And they have this kind of comical uh, piece of clip art of a fatigued prisoner in a ball of chains. Uh, and th this has since been removed from the web. They have this on the web, but only in the past year or so. It means that creators frame the MTurker workers as heroes without whom the data set could not have come into being. The hero's existence is not defined historically by their technical capacity by completing anonymous tasks, um, but by actions that have um, transformed, uh, that have purpose of transforming the human condition. Um, so artist uh, Mimi Anuha turns this construction on its head by rendering the mundane crowded home workspaces of the crowded um, image annotators as sites of heroism. Uh, and she illustrates these rumpled couches, crowded kitchens, tables, and home office desks in bright colors with a dramatic quote such as, human heroes only emerge in times of great need. And so you're sort of turning these as into heroic places in which the cutting edge of AI research is being constructed. Uh, I only have about uh, two and a half minutes. So I'm going to go through the next few slides somewhat quickly. We can talk about that a little bit in the Q&A. The third thing I want to present is how, and the third question is how have benchmark data sets become hegemonic or paradigmatic? And we know that it's not just that the size of these data sets become, are, are kind of the reason that they become adopted, but there has to be something to do with who's creating them at large. And so in some research that um, my colleagues, um, uh, or, or rather my collaborators, Bernie Koch and Jacob Foster um, at UCLA and sociology have um, focused on, along with um, uh, my colleague Emily Denton, we focus on asking and understanding benchmark dynamics, namely analyzing three research questions. How concentrated are machine learning task communities um, on specific data sets and has this changed over time? Two, how frequently do machine learning researchers borrow data sets from other tasks? And what institutions are responsible for the majority of ML benchmarks and circulations? For this, I'm just gonna to drop to um, the third slide in this. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, where we got these, the data, the data come from papers of code, which is a data set, um, uh, uh, which is a data set that we've drawn from um, the Papers of Code repository, which is uh, managed by Facebook AI research. Um, and then <coughs> focusing on the concentration of data sets, we actually find that um, there's a higher concentration. We, we developed a, a, um, a beta or regularized mixed effects model and actually estimate that concentration use of data sets is actually going up across time. If you look at the Gini coefficient at the bottom of this, and then I also want to focus very briefly, and I'm sorry to go this very quickly, um, that um, most of these data sets are actually being produced. 50% um, of data set usages actually are produced by a max, uh, basically 12 different institutions, most of them in the US, Stanford, Microsoft, Princeton, um, uh, and then Max Planck in Germany, Google, CUHK in, in China, AT&T, TGIC, NYU, Georgia Tech, Berkeley, and Facebook. And then there's a mix of corporate and nonprofit actors in this space. Lastly, what we wanna do is we want to uh, examine the current work practices, norms, routines that structure data collection, creation, and annotation. For this, we're going to conduct some uh, interviews with data set developers, as well as conduct multi-sided ethnography uh, at major AI labs at University of Toronto, Mila, uh, and Stanford. To conclude, I want to 
uh, note the implications of this work. One of the broader implications is that we want to expand the types of challenges that are allowed in algorithmic fairness research. One of the titles of this talk is Beyond Bias. And fairness often means not having enough representative data, and that gets cast as bias. There's kind of this search of having and reaching this mythical unbiased data set. We just have the right data. We want to flip this construction such that we focus more on this process of contestation. Contesting now focuses solely on having um, the uh, kind of a fair distribution of known categories, whether that's skin tone, geographical representation, or other things. In the case of ImageNet, after the publication of Crawford and Paglin's Excavating AI, the creators of ImageNet published this paper towards fair data sets, filtering and balancing the distribution of people in the subtree of the ImageNet hierarchy. What they ended up doing is removing uh, kind of offensive person categories and then uh, asking or, or having majority vote on whether um, certain concepts were imageable. They also tried to distribute the uh, 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 images according to uh, and having quote unquote fair distribution of images um, across skin tone, gender, and, and age. But this kind of misses the point. It misses the point of whether these things uh, are attentive to kind of the dynamics of consent, the dynamics of kind of care and particularities of viewing uh, um, uh, of what's contained in the data set. So what we argue is that one of the challenges that we make to transparency and fairness more broadly is we want to have insight into why certain classifications exist, who do they serve, and then turning a lens onto who has the power to classify. We want designers, engineers, and policymakers to have methods to show their work and to bring to, lights, motiv bring to light motivation, routines, and norms of creating classification and annotations. In a word, Emily Denton, Razvan Amaranesi, Andy Smart, Hillary Nicole, and, and, and Morgan Klaus Shireman and I make the statement, focusing on transparency itself with the goal of showing the internals of a system without plausible actions of being able to change aspects of the system are a period victory. We argue to center contestability instead and to think through ways of ways in contesting um, different, um, different systems. Ooh, someone lined on this. <laughs> With that, uh, thanks so much. I'm looking forward to your questions. And I want to give thanks to my collaborators, Emily Denton, Razvan, and Ronessi. Uh, Andy Smart, Hillary Nicole, Morgan Klaus Sharman, Bernie Coke, Jacob Foster, Jamil Smith, Lad, Tanich Brew, and Giselle Navarre, and Nate Mitchell. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was fantastic. I, we've had really, really good luck with people raising their hands and speakers fielding questions. Uh, if that's acceptable to everyone, we can do that. Otherwise, I can try to moderate, but you're probably better at answering questions than I am at moderating them. So. I, I have a question. Uh, this is Mary Lou Meyer. I'm in the College of Computing and Informatics. And this might seem like a strange question. My area of research is on computational creativity, mm. and particularly in this field called co-creativity, where you have humans and AI as partners to generate new products, new services, new designs. And this whole idea of images then um, takes on a different meaning. It's not only about categorizing them, but also the ethics of reusing them. Who owns the images and, and who, who owns the result when these lar very large image databases and, and text databases through deep learning are now available for reuse without any consideration to copyright or where did that come from? Or who, who does the result belong to? Is it the human that was interacting, the human that built the deep learning? And so I'm wondering whether you've given any thought as you're looking at these databases, um, in addition to fairness and explainability, there's, there's sort of a data provenance and ethical reuse issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what a great question. Um, so myself and 
excuse me, myself and Matt Habton, who is a fellow at Yale ISB, are working on a paper precisely on this that focuses on understanding consent, uh, copyright, privacy, and particular harms associated with these data sets. Um, I can give you a pretty short answer for this right now. The short answer is that for generative first on consent, um, one, you know, people have criticized kind of the notice and consent model of, of kind of different kinds of data collection, whether that's image data, but also more uh, kind of notably, it's, it's kind of personal data, especially by um, advertisers or, um, you know, uh, at, ba I mean, baby, basically Google and Facebook <laughs> um, that collect kind of the most data for advertiser um, uh, use and sort of the way that consent models fail in that way um, because they, they put the onus on this um, of kind of consent on the individual rather than having kind of a consumer uh, protection or kind of a regime of licensure. Um, so uh, that work's been written by um, Helen Nissenbaum and, and, and Salon Barkos on the failure of notice and consent, as well as other legal scholars like um, Ari Waldman and talking about privacy in, in Ryan Kahlo. And so the issue of consent is one, the issue of copyright is the other. And a number of people have written on how copyright issues, basically the argument is made that any kind of generative model that uses training data sets can be, they're arguing, considered fair use. Now, challenges to particular AI usages of this have not been challenged in court in any kind of way. There is no particular litigation, but this is probably going to be more, uh, this is probably gonna be coming up, especially with cases against Clearview AI um, um, in, in that, that are winding their way through the courts right now, as well as um, actually the example I presented. Um, yeah, yeah, Google thumbnail. So that's artist, thanks Gordon. Um, so artist guild versus um, art, well actually artist guild versus um, Google, was one that I think dealt with Google Books. Um, and then the, and then I think, the, if, I'm not sure what the Google thumbnails one is. There was also another one that was versus, that was against Amazon, I think, which was kind of, um, but I forget the particularities of that, that was focusing on that. Those are basically leveled as fair use. The courts have generally come into the, into, in, that ruled into, favor for particular organizations, corporate uh, uses of that, which have suggested that these uses are transformational enough. This is, there's sort of a four factor. I'm not a lawyer, so please excuse me if I state any of these wildly incorrect. This is my understanding being a sociologist that has an interest in law, um, but there's a four factor test to deem something uh, uh, fair use. Um, and um, so uh, they have deemed these sufficiently transformational and OpenAI, their policy team has said that, um, their policy team has written memos to that degree that said that any kind of generative use is actually fair use. Um, and they have a pretty uh, marked interest in this being developers of, you know, in taking massive amounts of textual data and then outputting kind of novel, um, novel text. So, yeah, so there's existing questions of this. Okay, so Gordon posted in the chat, treating images um, from sites that legally reposted porn. Um, the ruling said the main use was transformational. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that's the main thing. And a lot of the arguments being made by OpenAI and other legal scholars have suggested that this is transformational. However, you know, the kind of work, um, the work that Matt Hobb and I have been working on have been trying to catalog this because it's actually not only important to focus on the um, process of actually doing the generative modeling, but that the pipeline of developing these data sets actually goes through many different, different types of layers. 
So it's copying the data onto servers. It's the annotation of data. It's the training of pre uh, of pre trained embeddings. Uh, of, de of developing and reusing convolutional features in the terms of um, some of these um, large uh, large uh, image models. So there's actually a few different considerations. And then there's also different types of harms that come about. The harms don't only happen to focusing on copyright, but it's also at the level of privacy, at the level of um, harms that can come through um, the exposing uh, of particular faces or particular PII um, that 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 is more at risk and when it comes to textual modeling. Um, my my colleague Nicholas Carlini uh, and and Catherine Lee at Google Research have shown that there are ways in which existing models, uh, um, existing AI models. Um, uh, like GPT-2 actually expose PII uh, given particular prompts. This has also come via, um, this has also come up with GitHub Copilot and exposing of kind of API keys that get uploaded to GitHub. So this is like a really uh, vague space and there's not a lot of case law on this, um, but it's, you know, it's an excellent question and, and we're ho hoping submit this <laughs> in January and, and hopefully to have some kind of preprint available as well. So yeah, great question. So I want to do the, oh, sorry, Boyan. Gordon, you can, you can go, I can, I can go after you. Okay, it was, so there seems to be a tension building between size of data sets and curation of data sets, right? I mean, this shows up in the Stochastic Paris paper shows up in David Berhan's work on the alt text, you know, automatically tagged data sets. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on where that goes, because it keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a good, great point. I mean, I think that, you know, one thing that gets argued about, that gets argued, that's an argument that gets made by in stochastic parrots um, in other places is sort of um, you know like one of the one of the things that um, Bender et al argue is you know in stochastic parrots is that we just don't have enough documentation um, on 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 these different data sets. So for instance. Um, I don't think they talk about common crawl in stochastic parrots, but common crawl is the text data set that um, I think is associated with GPT-3 where it gets, where it's trained from, uh, which common crawl doesn't really have any documentation. Word to vec doesn't have any documentation other than saying it's from Google News. Um, so there's very little documentation on any, any of these. Um, and one of the um, one of the um, arguments that that gets made is sort of that curation, you know, like having more careful. One of the arguments we make in the uh, uh, due data sets have politics paper that I mentioned earlier is that there needs to be some more care around this, uh, around actually kind of labeling what's happening here. Now, I will say, you know, like. I wouldn't say that this works for every application. What I would say is that kind of being attentive to the kind of dynamics in reporting what's happening in different kinds of parts of data sets and what is, um, what, um, how those can be constrained in particular ways is sort of a challenge here in reporting what's happening. Um, I think data sheets are a really helpful tool in that toolkit, but data sheets themselves are not enough because data sheets themselves don't provide enough kind of normative guidelines on what should be reported on. One of the sort of underappreciated parts of the stochastic parrots paper, and I'll mention this here because, you know, <laughs> because this is, you know, Stochastic Paris was published under such, uh, you know, shady auspices, 
uh, I, I mean that shady on the part of my employer, I don't mean that shady on the part of the authors, is that one of the things that was written by um, my colleague Mark Diaz and has been um, uh, also one line of research that he has highlighted is that it really depends on what the text is and who the annotators are. Uh, and Mark has done really great work on showing that annotator identities and um, are really kind of critical to what gets labeled and how. His whole dissertation was on focusing on how people with, with disabilities uh, actually uh, get represented in sentiment analysis, or not, not people with disabilities, sorry, older people. I'm sorry, um, and I apologize for that, for that error. Um, and he's done some more recent work with my colleagues, uh, Vinod Prabhakar and, and an intern with our team, Adya um, uh, Devani, um, that have shown that um, uh, uh, it really depends on, and they actually try to model uh, and kind of divergent annotator annotations uh, and how that matters quite a lot. And so, um, and so one of the sort of arguments that I would sort of take from that is that we really need to understand there's some particular motivations for documentation on each of these things within data sheets. And one of the example I like to use is that in data sheets, one of the example data sheets is labeled faces in the wild. And the data sheet for data face, labeled faces in the wild they report the, the kind of percent split for racial categories in the data set. Those, those racial divisions are white, black, and Asian. Um, of course, that's a probably pretty problematic uh, kind of classification of people just to put them in those three. Of course, there's many more races than white, black, and Asian. There's very little justification for where it's, for why they use it that way and why those classifications are done in that way, or whether they should be doing any kind of racial classification at all. Um, so I think there's a lot more guidance that's needed. I think there's also a lot more disaggregation that's needed in doing this. I would actually, I'm, I'm gonna kind of plug a version, uh, a data set that tries to do this. I don't think they do it like quite well, but they actually try to disaggregate this a bit more. And that's a data set called the pile. Um, the, the pile is a, is a, um, a, a text data set um, that has, I think, 800 gigabytes or 850 gigabytes of textual data drawn from a lot of different locations. Um, to the, their credit, they have a data sheet that's not publicly posted to the web, but if you ask uh, Stella Biderman, one of the authors of the data set, she'll happily provide it. I actually find that the data sheet is a bit lacking because there's not a lot of guidance on how to actually annotate this. So I sort of, so I think it's not inherently wrong that data sets can be too big. I think there's other, I think there's, I think there's other types of critiques, which I agree with of like the kind of pernicious ways in which data size only allows certain kinds of actors to intervene. This is a point that I make with my co-authors in the piece that we wrote for Logic Magazine. Because data sets are so big, there's only certain types of actors that can manage them. However, I don't think that the size itself is a limiting factor. I think that there's ways of having a large data set that has sufficient curation, but it needs to have documentation, it needs to have resources and organizations that are going to be very attentive to ways of curating that are uh, responsible, that, are, that have a maintenance plan, um, that are not tied to major institutions, but it takes a lot of work to get there. Thanks, Alex. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for, for the talk. Uh, very, very informative. And, and, and I, 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 want to, uh, I want to actually uh, to ask for your opinion because uh, your, your study is preconditioned on the uh, deep learning being the engine behind 
classification of visual artifacts. Um, and deep learning became feasible around, you know, 20, 10, 11, 12, 13, when everyone could afford GPUs and build computers that could run these models, right? Uh, and so your, your, your analysis of the data sets is tightly coupled with this computational model uh, of building classifiers or generative models. Um, and within that model, we seem to be in an arms race uh, because of that logarithmic relationship between the size of the data set and the, and the uh, classification accuracy, right? And that we know where arms races end up. I mean, they, they go and go and go, and there is, you're, you're putting some understanding of the, of the, of the curation of the data sets in place and so on, but um, is there an end point for such a race? Uh, uh, we will always be slower in understanding the data sets and putting the limits on the applications or the types of things that are being investigated. Um, in other words, if by 2025, you know, Tesla's supercomputer, which is now used for their computer vision for, for navigation, autopilot, right? Uh, if that, that is not enough and, and the increases in speed of supercomputer are not that fast, we have to change the paradigm which may not be data set driven. So, so, so it's, it's, it's rather a philosophical question. Is this a temporary fix or temporary improvement in fixing something that's here? Or is there a longer term lesson that we are learning on taming the technology and, and, and that efficiency that you justifiably criticized as the driving factor? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a really excellent question. Um, and I, I, you know, and I don't have a particularly good answer. <laughs> I say this because one, you know, one thing is that there's huge kinds of ethical questions around this kind of gathering of data as pointed out here. The I, I appreciate your framing of, of this as an arms race because there's also pretty relevant geopolitical dimensions to this, right? I mean, if you talk to whatever Eric Schmidt or Henry Kissinger, who for some reason Henry Kissinger has a, has a book on AI, but like what they're basically, you know, arguing is that, you know, it's a very xenophobic, you know, China is the main enemy kind of thing. China is is gathering all these data without kind of any kind of recourse or cares about privacy and they're sort of a boogeyman, which I find to be, you know, which this plays pretty well in sort of a foreign policy establishment um, and kind of a defense mindedness, but, you know, what is what is to be done for kind of people that don't want to necessarily play that game uh, or get in, or or have other kinds of political commitments. Um, you know, my own my own view on this is that the way that these these things are going now is that the kind of you know like the kind of regulation that's that's in the works, and I know much less about the European context, so I'm going to misspeak when I mention this, but the AI bill working through European, the European legislatures looks much more at the sort of growth of data as being a very sort of pernicious kind of activity at the level of the US regulation. Again, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I know more about this, no, um, but it's, it seems to be the case that there's more attention to where the data is going. And I think where this gets stemmed is that this gets stemmed in such a way in which there's more attention to the ways in which um, 
and, and which sort of data is gathered with kind of reckless abandon for model training. And in the ideal scenario, we have something like a much more um, kind of regulated and a, uh, a kind of a, um, I don't want to just say regulated because that's too vague, but the way in which say health data becomes much more validated and externally uh, regulated um, by, um, uh, by entities such as the FDA, FDA or the ways in which uh, airplane data uh, or airplane test data becomes regulated by NTSB or um, and the, the National Highway, um, well, I guess it's NTB, T, NTSB in this case. Um, the problem with that, of course, is regulatory capture, right? The idea that the only people who are in these positions to evaluate these sufficiently are people who used to work at Google or Apple or, or Facebook, uh, which is sort of you know the problem that happened with um, you know the 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 what is it the 747 Max and in the kind of uh, you know the kind of um, checkoffs of safety because the pe only people who could evaluate these used to work at Boeing or Airbus or whatever. Um, we do see some helpful movement in that space within the FTC. Uh, right now, that the way that the FTC has re recently enlisted um, some AI uh, whistleblowers, such as Meredith Whitaker, um, Am uh, Amba Cock, um, Sarah Myers West, who are all at AI now. Uh, Lena Khan is the head of the FTC. Um, but then the, it's sort of to be seen whether that can actually stem the sort of arms racing nature of this, right? Because it's a lot, it's a pretty tall order for the FTC to do this regulation when there's just so much, you know, so many different uses and so much different data collection. Um, so again, I don't have a great answer for you, but I do, would say like, I think there's something that's gonna have to give. There are some kind of models that look like this in terms of national oversight. You know, but there's a lot of challenges that are standing in that way, especially this pretty explicit nationalistic arms race that exists, especially for data driven AI and these huge amounts of data that are being collected um, for, you know, to, to train models, do benchmarking, to, to do inference. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alex, for the talk. Uh... I had a question, but I'm gonna modify it a little based on your last response, uh, which Yash, by the way, uh, for everyone else on the call. Uh, when you say regulatory bodies or corporations or educational institutions, they have to take some ethical responsibility. Is that et ethical response, does that ethical responsibility translate to paying people for their data? Like, does it mean that when applying for grants, we have to have a bigger portion saying, hey, we're going to use all this money to pay for recruiting and getting consent. Our company is going to start paying more. Again, at institutions, there's a big difference between nonprofit versus profit, right? Why would for-profit institutions willingly pay more or cut their profits back for ethical in, uh, ethical issues, which when nobody is mandating them or nobody is, there's no consequences. So I was just wondering, what are some ways to ensure that we're doing ethical data building? Yeah, this is a great question. Thanks so much, Josh. I appreciate it. We talk a little about this a little bit in the computer vision, the do data sets up politics paper, where we talk about thinking about particular types of care in thinking about paying people for their data, there are models of this that exist. One thing I actually, you know, like, you know, want to point out or actually give some kudos to is actually Facebook has a has a, a data set called the Casual Conversations data set. Um, what it is is short clips of different videos um, um, of people that they use mostly for facial analysis technologies, and they actually pay people for their for actually being in the data set. Um, so this is less about sort of, you know, the types of movements that say a sort, like paying people for their Facebook data, 
which there's been like kind of movements around like paying face, you know, paying Facebook or Facebook paying users. Um, that's not exactly what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is more of the, the thought of um, the kind of paying of data subjects to be in a data in a data set, and there, and then also being very attentive to how those data sets being distributed, as well as paying annotators well and um, paying people who are doing labeling of those data. And this has been the focus of other movements, like in other or organizing projects like Tricopticon. Um, um, that's that's work that's been done by Lily Ronnie and M6 Silverman. Um, and it continues that today as an organizing project. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think those are really important types of interventions. Um, now, to your first question, like what's actually forcing people to do this because there are no consequences. The more and more I think the, right now the policy lags uh, much of the, um, the policy lags much of the practice now. With regards to diversity and faces, diversity and faces actually is IBM has been sued as well as actually several other organizations um, by people in um, by um, uh, um, some plaintiffs in under the Illinois uh, the Illinois the Illinois Biometric Privacy Act. Um, in that, in the fact that they were using individuals' data without their consent, um, the Illinois Biometric Privacy Act is one of the most restrictive and aggressive in terms of privacy in um, in the U.S. Um, but there are sort of ways in which these. Um, yes, thank you, Gordon. Yeah, BIPA is the only state that requires affirmative consent for biometric data collection. And so because of that, it's, it's sort of yet to be seen where whether privacy legislation will mimic the, will mimic BIPA. Um, California is not as restrictive. I think, it, I think it's a notice and consent model, but I'm not sure on that. Um, you can ask for opt out, but you can do that for, um, let's say Clearview AI, you can actually opt out of it, but it's only if you live in California, um, they won't actively, you know, but it's only affirmative consent is for BIPA. Um, why Facebook ended up doing this? You know, there's other kinds of ways to force this. A lot of them are, you know, bad press coverage, you know, um, you know, other types of ways. Facebook already is pretty afraid of being targeted for their many, many other kinds of ethical abuses and privacy abuses. So I think they're being proactive about that um, as, a, as a tool. But I think like the kind of idea here is that there is privacy legislation coming. Uh, Facebook, Google, and others have been putting massive amounts of lobbying effort into shaping it in a way that's friendly to their business models while pointing to others and saying, you know, we're not like those other guys, um, but it's more about what that's going to look like um, and when it's going to happen. So, oh yeah, thanks, thanks for pointing it out. Like that's, that's, that's a huge thing to, to point out there uh, that Facebook is losing a major lawsuit over BIPA. So yeah, I mean, those kinds of, you know, that, that type of, um, you know, privacy legislation is coming. It's basically showing it. Is it going to be the next wave of diversity training? Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe the ethics training, I think, is sort of, I mean, there's a lot of ethics washing that happens to uh, companies where there's a lot of ways that companies are saying they're doing the ethical thing, but are not um, really doing it. They're doing enough to sort of cast a veneer of something that they're doing. The training, I think, gets into another dimension of this. Is, yeah. Yeah, er, Ari Waldman, so there's good conversation. Ari Waldman, I saw him speak last week and it was very depressing at the possibility of that. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's impossible of IRB sanctioned biometric training. I actually don't think that's true. I actually think that IRB 
um, IRBs could be more aggressive in this. Right now, I right now there's no there's no mandation of IRBs, and the problem is that most of these organizations at the corporate level don't have an IRB equivalent. The only one that I know of in a research institution that exists is that Microsoft has an internal review board. But I actually don't think that's sufficient. I think there needs to be independent aud auditors that act like IRBs. I actually think there's major limitations to having an IRB too, because IRBs actually under existing regimes actually would qualify much of these data sets for exemptions because they say these, these images are already quote unquote public, but there is a danger in doing the aggregation itself. Um, so I actually don't know. I actually would, 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 would push back on that. I actually think it is possible and is necessary. I, I directed the collection at the order of tens of thousands when I was faculty at West Virginia, but we were just, it, it's not enough for deep learning. If, even if you have thousands of images, uh, faces or iris or whatever, uh, that's, that's not nearly enough. So all these faces in the wild and so on just overtook in the development because uh, if you really follow IRB and, and uh, you allow people to withdraw and, and, and you know, it's, it, it adds complexity and cost, I don't think you can get to the order of millions. Uh, and that's what we are talking about. I would say that IRB, but IRB doesn't necessarily try to obtain consent. Consent. I mean, that's not actually um, acquiring IRB. I mean, the IRB mandates, IRBs mandate that you kind of adhere to the Belmont report in which, you know, technologies need to, you know, minimize harm as much as possible, uh, establish beneficence for research subjects and users. And, um, I, I mean, and there's a third one, which I'm forgetting right now, but it doesn't actually mandate consent. Um, if you actually wanted to have a consent, affirmative consent model, I actually, yeah, I agree. I actually couldn't get that for millions of users or millions of people in the images. I don't think it's plausible, but I don't even know if affirmative consent, I don't even, I, I, don't, I don't actually think that's plausible either, but IRBs don't mandate that. Kate Crawford has a paper that basically says there's no way that any of this data is going to fall under the common rule because it's already public uh, in the first place. And she's like, yeah. she, she does not like that fact, but it's a pretty methodical demonstration of how that may not work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Does anybody else have further questions? I could continue all afternoon, but we don't actually technically have all afternoon, I don't think so. Um, well, in that case, let me, or let, I can't produce this since let's all thank um, Alex for the talk today. Uh, we got a lot out of it and I hope that you did too. And so until next time, we will say goodbye. Thank you, Thanks, all. Alex. Thanks for the great questions. Bye.